Hey everyone, my name is Amy Wright Glenn and I am the founder of the Institute for the Study of Birth, Breath and Death. This is our July Institute webinar. Every month we have a webinar that involves, well usually involves an interview with someone in the field of birth, breath or death or someone in the field of all three. And Corinne is, Corinne Andrews is with us and I welcome her. I will formally introduce her soon. I welcome you, whether you're listening via recording or you're live with us, I welcome you with a warm heart. I'm so grateful you took your time to be with us. So thank you. And I'd like to start us, start us all off with a mindful breath practice. And that will involve sitting up tall so your ears are aligned over your shoulders and your sternum gently lifts. So just gently lift the chest, open up the, the spaciousness in your beautiful rib cage and your belly, shoulders down the back and drop that tailbone into the earth while lifting the top of the head up to the sky. You can feel an, an elongation through your torso and spine. I recommend closing the eyes if that doesn't make you dizzy. If you'd rather have your eyes open, you can glance down and find a soft and gentle place to rest your gaze. Take a few breaths here with me. And inhale and exhale. Just noticing that, that flow of in and out with the breath in and out. And with gratitude for our practice together, I invite you to take your hands and rub them together. And you can leave your eyes closed for a moment, uh, juice up your hands with good energy and love and kindness and strength and place your hands anywhere on your body where those qualities would be welcome. Maybe the face, the neck, the back of the head, the shoulders, perhaps even massaging your muscles Open the eyes when you feel ready. Mm, some good breath awareness and body awareness, which is perfect because our guest is all about breath and body awareness. And so thank you for joining me. I am really happy to introduce a dear, a dear soul, a dear person, a wise, a wise woman, a mother, a yogi, um, pilgrim on the spiritual path, someone who has a deep and clear understanding of what embodied yoga means, what prenatal yoga means, what um, mommy and me yoga means, also what, mean, what it means to practice yoga in times and seasons of grief. Corinne has a, a, a long resume of many certificates and studies and completions of trainings. She trains teachers She's a yoga teacher trainer, and she's co-founder and co-director of Yoga Center Amherst in Massachusetts. She's also a dear friend and a sister in my spirit. So I'm thrilled you're here, Corinne, I'm thrilled. So uh, thank you for being here. Thank you, my love. Thank you so much for having me. And hello to everyone, especially if you're here live, but also if you're here on the recording, because I know many of you will be watching this later. So mwah, hello to all of you. It's awesome. So to start us off, I would love for you to, to tell me what, what's happening in this picture. You know, this is a snapshot of your life. I love how the sun is hitting your hair. There's a, um, a light and inspiring um, look on your face. I know it looks like you're practicing or teaching yoga. It looks like you have a framed picture and a candle lit behind you of two individuals who are important to you. Why don't you talk us through this picture? Yeah, thank you. It's so interesting that this is the first photo to, um, to come up on the share. So this is um, a picture of me teaching in um, a, a very, very special place. This is, we take people each year, well, pre-COVID, we were taking people each year um, on pilgrimage to South India. 
So this photo is, <clears throat> this is in this incredible circular yoga hall that has all screens. You know, there's, there's walls, but there's all screens and you hear the birds, you feel the sun, the, the air and the vibration in this place of, this is in Auroville in South India and the vibration, um, it's, it's different, you know, I always feel that. And that's probably kind of also what you sense this, I'm looking, I'm feeling the, you know, the, the South Indian sun and the atmosphere um, that, you know, it's, 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 an, it's a utopia that has its problems, right? <laughs> like any, any aspirant, any community that's aspiring towards um, unity um, and higher consciousness will still have its problems. So it's both. Um, and yeah, so in the, in the background, this is the altar that actually lives in this space. Um, and this is a photo that you see of the mother in Sri Aurobindo, who, um, if I were to sum up their teachings, it's to live a life divine. It's to live yoga in our every moment, our every breath, our every action, everything we do in life so that there's no separation um, you know, like here's our spiritual life and here's the rest of our life. It's let's live one life divine. How do we live a life divine? So um, yeah, so that's them. And of course, I, I love to light a candle um, for practice, whether it's my own personal meditation time or teaching. Um, so yeah, that's, that's a brief summary of what was happening in this photo. I love it. It does capture something of you, which is why I wanted it to be the first. And, and I know this symbol means a lot to you. I know it does. And I think there's so much you could say and even maybe lead a meditation for us relating to this, because I wanted to start off with pictures that lift up something about the essence. I know it lives in you. And, and when we think about the theme of, of birthing mama and what it means to have written this book that you've written and, you know, really exploring the legacy of your teaching and your family and, what you do in this world. I know this is an important symbol. So perhaps you can talk me through or tell me about it. What does this mean to you and what does it stand for? Yeah, um, okay. So this is what we call the mother symbol who you just saw in that photo. The mother, her name is Mira Alfasa but um, she's called lovingly the mother. So this was the symbol that she created. And this particular photo is a, is a brass rendition of it. Um, which I, I love. And the very first time I saw the symbol and I didn't know anything about it um, was when I was in India for the very first time. It was um, maybe only nine years ago, something around then. And I saw the symbol and it grabbed me and I didn't know anything about it, but it called me. Um, so what I'll say is this, because there, <laughs> there is a lot to say about it. And some of you who've been in my teacher trainings know that it's part of the foundation that the whole training rests on. So here in the, the center of the, the whole symbol here, it, this is the, um, the Mahashakti, also sometimes called the Aditi. So you can think of it as um, the, the, the sacred holy breath that creates the universe. So in, in the teachings of yoga, we have pure consciousness and then we have creative manifestation. And um, in this particular teaching, it's, it's the divine mother that brings that breath, that energetic, it's Shakti, right? So Maha Shakti, Maha means the great and Shakti means power. And it's not power like ego power. It's the power of creation it's energy, it's, it's the soul expressing itself in its depth and in its truth. So when we see the, the Mahashakti in the center, it's saying that this is what gives rise to everything we see in the world. Like everything is made up of the vibration of the divine mother, like in essence. And then it takes its form, it takes its unique expression, you know, whether it's the strap I'm going to use for my asana practice or my mug or my garden or a person. So inside of all of us, we are filled with the presence of Mahashakti, this great power, the source. Um, and then <clears throat> the four petals are four of the expressions of the divine mother. 
um, in the yogic tradition, we have tons of devas and gods and goddesses. So this is just four um, representations or four expressions of the divine mother. So we have uh, Maheshvati, Mahalakshmi, Mahasarasvati, and Mahakali. Um, and then around the whole rest of the circle, we have 12 qualities that we are invited to <clears throat> both embody in our personal lives to apply to our relationship to the divine. Because as I was saying earlier, one of the main teachers is to the teachings is to live a life divine and to be a servant of divine consciousness. So they always say, this is not a religion. You don't need to be a specific, you know, race, religion, or um, doesn't matter where in the world you're from. If you want to serve divine consciousness, if you want to be a part of human unity, caring for one another as though we are really one family, loving the earth, we're all invited into this. So we uh, look to embody qualities like humility, sincerity, generosity, uh, progress, aspiration, peace, equality. Let's see, what am I forgetting? Anyway, but it's, so it's, it's like that. Um, there, there's a lot more to say about it all, but I'm conscious of our time. So I think I'll pause for a moment and just see how that landed. Well, it brought tears to me. I'm like wiping my face. I think it's beautiful. That's partly why I lifted it up. I also find it beautiful. And it's something that I could see I, I would want in my home. You know, this, this, when, as soon as you shared this with me, I thought, oh, that is, it's a beautiful tattoo. It's a beautiful henna. It's a beautiful thing to hang on the wall. It's a, to meditate on. And when you talk through it, I feel, I felt tears. So just, um, thank you so much. It's beautiful. Yeah, thank you. I also love the four people here. <laughs> and it's been a while since I've seen your your family, you know, in Massachusetts. Uh -huh. We saw each other briefly here in Florida before COVID. But if you want to just take a moment and tell us who's in your family, your direct biological, you know, your nuclear family here, who are these beautiful beings here? Yeah, sure. So, and also just a gentle reminder to mute yourself if you're not muted. Um, okay, so yeah, so this is myself over here and this is my husband, Matthew. This is our daughter, Irina, and our son, Aaron. And this photo was taken uh, four years ago. I think it's four years now. This was on our first family trip to India. This was the first time both Matthew and I had been, but this was the first time that we were going together as a family. And, and this is very much, um, our life, you know, like they're, they're, they are children that definitely are their own and they're strong and they are pursuing not quite the yogic path. They are both very, uh, in love with musical theater, um, and, the arts in that way, which to me really is no different than what I'm doing. It's all connected. But, um, but we definitely, we live as much as we can a spiritual life together, you know, without forcing it upon them. So, so yeah, these are my beloveds that um, I've been blessed to, to journey with <laughs> in many, many profound ways. I love it. I know that sometimes uh, I often will feel Tabor is my greatest spiritual teacher, you know, the, the child, the, the power to live every day with a child or see a child develop and then see the world at times through the child's eyes is such an incredible, incredible gift. Yeah, and I, I say that actually for, you know, teaching prenatal and postnatal yoga for the past 11-ish years, that is what I always say at the end of the class that let us bow to our, either the life growing within or the children all around us because they are our greatest spiritual teachers. You know, I, I do have a guru, a, you know, a living guru, but, but my children, um, they show me things that no one in the world could ever um, open my eyes and my heart to in the way that they do. So I am with you on that. 100%. Well, here's yoga and musical um, connection, connecting. Right? We know there's a, a very strong tradition in the yogic practice of bhajan or song and devotion and kirtan and music as a form of prayer, as a form of praise, as a form of 
lamentation. And here you have your family doing, um, creating music together. And so many families love creating music together. What I think is interesting here is in your caption to me, you said, we're doing Kirtan music. So this is your music that connects to your spiritual practice. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, if that's true. Oh, and we have a new member joining us. It's lovely. Um, Kirsty, if you can mute your mic, that would be great because we're recording. That would be wonderful. Thank you. So correct me if I'm wrong, Krim, but tell me what's happening in this picture and, and share with me how music is a part of uh, your practice and your, and your being. Yeah, so um, I am not the musician of the family, although I love chanting. So I, in, in my classes, I only lead simple chanting, um, but I, and I can drum along, but I'm not really in the family band. I'm like the, the um, you know, the band, what, what do we call them? The devotee of the band, the groupie. Uh -huh. um, my husband, it, Matthew, is he does lead Kirtans and um, and he made a beautiful album a few couple years ago, and the kids accompany him, which is amazing. So um, Aaron will usually play keyboard and do a little bit of singing, but mostly keyboard, and Irina um, is often the responder because usually not always, but there's call and response. Um, so Irina will often be the responder. Um, and we as a family over COVID, we've been taking online voice lessons and I was taking them as well, or I am taking them as well. Um, not because I will lead singing, but it has brought about an incredible healing for my throat, my voice and my learning to speak truth because this is something that is so crucial in the world we're living in today is can we speak from our heart? Can we sing from our heart? Can we chant and call out to all of the divine help that is all around us and within us? And it's very much to do with, with the throat and the mouth. And of course, you know, like Vishuddha Chakra, the, the energy center in the throat. So, um, so yeah, so I've been learning a little bit to use my throat and sing in this way. And it is one of the most joyful things for me to sing and chant all together as a family, as a community. Um, I have a very bhakti heart. I love all expressions of the divine one, like whatever part of the world they might be expressing themselves from. Um, it's very uplifting. If you've, if you, those of you who are watching, if you've never done um, chanting or devotional singing, I highly um, encourage you to try it. You can also dance while you're singing, which I love. You can sit and meditate. You can lie down on the floor and just receive. Actually, receptivity is one of the 12 qualities I forgot to mention in Mother Symbol. So the, the chanting and singing is not just about a calling out or praising. It's a receiving of, of love. I love it. And speaking of receiving love, when I saw this, my heart just opened. I felt so grateful. I think of your work. I mean, you and I have collaborated quite a bit with Birthing Mama over the years. And this captures how I see you in my heart. When I think of you as a teacher, as a friend, as a mom, just the way you're talking to these little ones, how they're all so close to you. It's almost like a little flower petal of babies around you. I love this, Corinne. And and I imagine, I'm imagining this is a mommy and me yoga class or perhaps a reunion of prenatal yoga students who brought their babies for you to meet them. But please tell us what's happening here because it's just delightful. Yeah, I love this photo. This one of my students uh, sent this to me. She had taken it in the class. So yeah, in a, along with teaching prenatal yoga, I have always also taught postnatal yoga. Um, and I call it parent and baby yoga because we, we don't always just have mamas. Sometimes we have papas or other caretakers. So I, I, inclusivity is very important to me. Um, and it's become even more important in the past few years as my consciousness expands more. Um, so yeah, so postpartum parent and me or parent and baby. And this is exactly <laughs> what you see this flower petal as you were describing um so sometimes 
we are uh, blessed in a parent and baby yoga class where it's a smaller group like it was here this day. And I can actually gather up all the babies close. This is of course pre-COVID where we weren't so afraid to be with each other. There wasn't so much uh, caution. And I hope someday we will get to do this again in person. Um, so yeah, sometimes during the class, I will entertain the babies while I'm still teaching a class. So I call um, the parent and baby yoga class zoo baby yoga because it's a zoo. It's a total zoo because you're basically teaching as many classes at once as there are people in the room. This here was a, a special moment where all the babies were like engaged with me and I was, I don't remember exactly what I was talking the, um, the parents through, but they were doing something with breath and movement while we were having a good time with each other. <laughs> I love it. That's beautiful. Lasha just captures such a moment. And I know, as you mentioned, COVID, and, and I apologize, this, this photo is a little blurry. We don't have to stay here long. But COVID did shift so much and with, with the heightened caution and the need for safety, especially for the vulnerable populations. And you know, just note, again, noting and lifting up that there are many countries in the world still deeply struggling with COVID. And we had 600,000 people in our country died connected to it. So it was a, a hard, hard year our world has faced and in many places still facing. Uh, yet it didn't deter you, Corinne, you continued teaching and, and you taught yoga and touched people in a way that was beyond just Amherst, Massachusetts, you know, just a deep, a deep blasting out through the internet of, of your work. What was that like for you to shift and, and how have you been shifting back to in-person now? Yeah, well, so I had just returned home from India when um, things shut down here in the US. So I'd only been home for a week. I'd only taught maybe one or two classes and then you know everything shut down, the, kid, the kids' school, schools closed and, um, and I said, okay, well, that's it. I, I'm not gonna do this online teaching. I've never taught online. And, and, you know, I was like, I was in a reactive mode, like of, you know, and plus I was still in India. I wasn't even really here yet. And then I was meditating at my altar <clears throat> and I heard what I always say is like the whispers of the divine mother. And I heard, you need to get your, all the classes at Yoga Center Amherst on Zoom now, and you need to do it today. And I was like, what? But I always listen because I always receive guidance and it's always something I don't want to do. It's like, really? You want me to do that? Okay, I am a humble servant. I'll listen. So luckily, my husband, Matthew, was able to also get back on like the last flight out of India. He was supposed to stay and lead another retreat. Um, and he was the brains behind getting us online. And um, I have to say it was a year of letting go. It was a year of grief, um, not just personal, but global. Um, it was a year of being fully with my children, even though they're, you know, they're older now, they're not under, I don't know how people with kids under age 10 did it because mine were um, 10 and then 11 and then, you know, 14 and then 15, which was a little easier, but also not. Um, but we did it and we taught um, the whole, you know, all the classes at the yoga center switched to Zoom. And this was the reality for yoga teachers everywhere. None of us were ever taught how to do this. We all took a leap of faith. We were all like Hanuman leaping across the ocean saying, okay, we, we love this. We love our students. We're going to do it. So it was like a rising up to the occasion. Um, there was a lot of fumbling. There still sometimes is with tech. I am not a really savvy tech person. Um, but I also managed to teach a full 200 hour embodied yoga teacher training and a full 90 hour birthing mama teacher training on Zoom. And we had people exactly as you said, not just in Amherst, Massachusetts, but all over the country and even people from Uganda, from Greece, um, Canada, you know, different parts of the world. So um, it's been challenging and, um, an incredible learning experience. And again, one to be really humble and say, okay, show me the way, show me how I'm supposed to serve next. Um, and now, now we're in a very strange time uh, yet again, because we let go of our um, studio in, in town um, 
back in September because of COVID, but also um, looking to be in a deeper sense of right relationship with the people we rent from. And we didn't have that. Uh, we, we are a pay from the heart yoga center. So everything we do through Birthing Mama and the yoga center is all pay from the heart. So we're looking now for a new studio that can be energetically in alignment with the values of pay from the heart. Um, so we're still operating either online through Zoom or at a local park. Um, and I don't know, will we find a space? You know, it's, a, it's another uh, radical invitation into trust. Mm. And I know your practice uh, in terms of your, your spiritual, mental, physical, emotional, you know, the, the full body um, surrender into trust, you know, as a mom, as a yoga teacher, as a human being is connected a lot to roots that go to yoga practice in India and yoga practice here in the U.S. And, and I loved how you said this, you know, the Swami photo bombed the picture of you in arena. And then again, here's some puja an offering to the mother and, and Sri Aurobindo, 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 Aurobindo with an O at the end. You have to remind me. But if you could speak for a minute about how you found yoga or how yoga found you. I mean, I would be interested to know, you know, how your your spiritual trajectory and this deep practice connected. Yeah. Okay. So let me try to say it uh, simply. This is something I'm working on: is how can I express the depth and all that there is to say about something in fewer words? It's a it's a practice for me. So um, I think you know the journey really began. Um, as a, as a child where I was very highly sensitive. My, my parents will often joke that I didn't sleep and I cried about things and I complained about things. And I, my eyes would always pop open, you know, feel, seeing and feeling everything around me. So I came into this world, what I would call a highly sensitive person. Um, and in high school was seeking out um, alternative realms of consciousness or expansive states of consciousness, which was through the usage of um, substances, you know, um, psychedelics, that sort of thing. Um, and I, I was like unhappy, you know, I was seeking, I, I knew there was something else to life. I mean, I, I come from an incredibly loving, generous, amazing family um, and, uh, you know, very mainstream. And I just knew, I was like, there's something, there's something else. There's something more. Um, I come from Holocaust survivors who, went lived through hell and I grew up hearing you know if there was a god why would our whole family have been killed you know and 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 more because genocide happens across the board around the world um so I I was seeking in my own quiet way and I got to college at UMass and I don't even know how but like stumbled upon a yoga class I'd never heard of yoga um, I didn't know what it was. I just knew what psychedelics were <laughs> and expanded states of consciousness. And I would say yoga found me. Yoga saved my life. Yoga took me as if it was a being and, and grabbed a hold of me. And it's like I became married to this practice and this path. And I, you know, I drank up everything I possibly could, whether it was teachers and classes or um, books, you know, all I wanted to do was eat, sleep, drink, read, breathe, anything that had to do with the yogic tradition. Um, and all I ever wanted to do was go to India. It, it took me quite a while to finally get there, um, partially because I, I got pregnant when I was 25. And that brought me on a journey of finding the ashram within because it wasn't the time for me to be sent. I always wanted to, to live in an ashram. Um, and I guess maybe the last thing I'll say about this is, so my college years, I really gave up all of, you know, I actually haven't drank alcohol since I was 21. Um, I'll be 42 soon. Um, I gave up a, a whole particular way of life, which we might call a social way of life. I lost interest in it. Um, and when I did graduate college, um, I, Matthew, who's my husband, we, um, who was like the guy I liked at the time, we drove cross country and I lived for six months at the Mount Madonna Center, who at the time, Baba Haridas was still alive. He was the living guru there. 
Um, and I just, again, was like, oh, this is it for me. This is, um, you know, and I, then I went back the following year and, and I went on to take, as you know, many teacher trainings. Um, and I just knew I had to share. It brings me to tears, you know, because being a highly sensitive person, I always struggled with anxiety um, and being overwhelmed by the way the world is and just was called, you know, called to be able to share what I had learned. You know, I didn't need to go on medication. I didn't need to leave society because yoga found me. And so I just knew I was like, oh, I have to, I have to offer these jewels, these gifts to everybody I know, because it's so profound. Um, yeah, I don't know why I'm crying so much, but it's so profound, uh, these practices, so. I love you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, it, it is, they're deep practices. It's the deepest work. Uh, so I, I will invite you, Corinne, and I will join you and all listening live or in person and those listening to be recording just to pause and feel into the emotional tone that was just expressed, that deep heartfelt expression, the words shared, the story shared. You could um, bring hands to heart, that's called heart-centered breathing, to place the palms to the heart. You can close the eyes. And there's definitely been research that this heart-centered breathing calms the nervous system, settles the energy. And when you combine it with breath awareness, which I invite you to do now, notice the inhale. Notice the exhale. Really letting Corinne's story settle into your own heart. The places you connect, the places you're different, the places that inspire, the places that bring questions. Really letting it settle into you with the breath. Take a few more inhale and exhale rounds. And this is done not to quiet the tears. The tears are always welcome, but to integrate and to reconcile and to hold them as sacred. And one more deep breath in through the nose. Exhale through the mouth. Settling the energies, opening the eyes, and taking in the beauty of this this woman's path and her and her teachers that she's known. You know, teachers through her children, through yoga practice, the, the different um, spiritual teachers she's met. I know this. This is your current guru and a woman who's living now, who you know and have known for many years, and who means such so much to you. And for those, some of you live may know also, um, also connect and others will be like, oh, who's this? So let me take a moment and just invite you to introduce her to us. Great, thank you. And I also, I just wanna say thank you for that pause. Um, it's so important to pause and especially that long exhale, which, you know, as we know, brings toning to the vagus nerve. and helps to bring a, a deep sense of, of integration. And I, I love what you said, Amy, it's not about quieting the tears, it's about integrating it and honoring um, a sacred moment. So I, I just wanna say thank you for that. Um, it, was, it was helpful for me um, and, I, and it's what we teach, right? It's what we, we offer, so thank you. Um, and yeah, so this is my beloved Guruji Ma and I first met her mm, almost 20 years ago and um, my experience of meeting her was when I looked into her eyes, I saw the, the depth of the ocean. I saw the expansiveness of the universe. 
Um, and when she spoke to me, I actually heard her voice like an angel. And I didn't, I don't really know about angels. I didn't ever connect to angels. So I was like, oh, this is interesting. Why do I hear her voice like angels singing to me? That's not, I don't really do the word angels. Um, and I've had an incredible, <laughs> literally, you know, 20 years with her as my teacher. I've, I had a few years where I, I did not see her or talk to her because I'm, I'm a stubborn person. I'm a Leo, I am all fire. I, um, I have a guru because of my depth of devotion and because this is a being who is the real deal. She's not trying to convince anybody of anything or tell me who I should be or how I should be. In fact, anytime I ask her like, Will you tell me what to do? She always, like her main teaching for me personally is, Corinne, find your voice. Stop acquiescing to all that everybody tells you you have to be. Who are you? Why are you here? And, you know, and what she'll say to each person is very different because it's whatever that person's soul is, um, is expressing or, you know, or here to do here to offer. So it's a very personal path. It's not like linear, you know, it's not like, I mean, she has a million teachings. You could go on the Light Omega website and see she's written countless writings or countless videos and recordings of all of her spiritual teachings. Um, they're very much in alignment with the teachings of Sri Aurobindo and the mother, which again, comes back to living a life divine, embodying yoga, so that everything we do is part of our spiritual life. Nothing is separate. It's all one yogic practice. And that's, that's like at the core of her teaching. Be, you know, be a participant in, in this grand spiritual experiment um, and wake up to who you are. And, and greatly, greatly about service. It's very much the path of, of serving one another and serving the earth. Um, so yeah, she is my, is my beloved teacher and I'm very blessed. I, I always say to people, um, I don't know how you live without either a guru or a therapist because life is, is so complicated, especially if you're pursuing a path of awakening, of deepening your consciousness, of becoming more aware, more, if you want to contribute to a world that is more just, more equal, more peaceful, more right. I don't know how you do it on your own, you know? And we do it in community where we reflect with one another, absolutely. But, you know, someone who you trust with every cell in your body, who you can hear the hard stuff that, and look at the hard stuff, um, it's hard. I, I'm not gonna lie. It's not a glamorous path at all. It's not, um, but it is the most joyful, like joyful in the, in the sense of sat chit ananda, truth, consciousness, bliss. It is like divine delight in the depth of my being to be in relationship with Guruji Ma as much as it is um, hard and painful to, to see um, a lot of what is within me or within the world as it is currently. So yeah, it's a blessing. Okay. And he is available. Like if, you know, I, I don't like to preach. I don't like to push. I know there's been a lot of harm done <laughs> in the world of gurus and the guru shishu relationship, especially in modern yoga. Um, it's like one after the other, the fall of grace in the world of yoga communities, spiritual communities and gurus. So I, I know there's a lot of trauma and I respect it. Um, and I don't know, somehow I've been blessed to only ever be with, with real gurus. And, and not be harmed, not be hurt. So, so she's available if you ever do um, want to, to learn from her teachings. So yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. I love this. And I'm wondering if this is the room, you know, these, these, we're coming to the end of the pictures, but I'm wondering, is this, you help me understand, is this the outside of that room that you were in before or is this a different building? No, so um, Mo, this is um, one of the huts on the land that's called Mohanam. So okay. Mohanam is, um, was started by my beloved spiritual sister and brother, Rajavani and Balu. And um, so the, uh, Auroville is made up of, it's like a city, you know, if you can think of a city with all these different communities and um, businesses and restaurants and, 
And then of course the soul of it, the center is the Matra Mandir, which is um, Matra Mandir is uh, the, the mother temple, but it's, it's not a religious temple in that way. It's really meant to go in and meditate and be in the place of stillness and silence and peace. So this, this is um, one of the huts um, and you see this beautiful column out in front of it, which is, um, it's like a mandala that people are more familiar with. Um, or Rangoli, which is more common up in the north. Um, but down in the south, Kolam is what they often call the women's yoga, where early in the morning as the sun is rising, you will see in the villages, um, I believe in the cities too, but I'm more, I spend a lot more time in the villages when I go to India um, and you know, out in nature as you see here. So you'll see the, the sweeping and the watering and it is like, it's, it's loving the earth with your body, with your breath, with water, and then making these intricate um, kolam designs, these mandalas, and, and it's, they're, they are not easy to make. I've been trying to make them for years. They are not easy. So yeah, so this is Mohanam and we spend a lot of time at Mohanam. We support, uh, they are our sister community. Um, they recently started a group called Aro Shakti, and we had a, a live stream kolam workshop as part of our Birthing Mama teacher training this year. So we were live streaming with our sister community in India, learning about the sacred art of Kolam. Um, so this, uh, we, yeah, I spend a lot of time on this land here. And Mohanam as a whole is a cultural center whose purpose is to preserve Tamil culture. And um, in, in all senses, music, food, art, dance, um, all of it, yoga. Um, and to really uphold and support kids, you know, to give village children opportunities, to give village women opportunities. So there's a lot of women empowerment because this is not the history of India where women have been empowered. So um, they, at Mohanam, they're doing incredible things. It's um, been very difficult in the COVID times, which is why we've done more efforts. Uh, we do a lot of fundraising efforts um, to support Mohanam. So, so that's what you see here. And, and the other photo in the very beginning, that was in Verite, which is where we, we all stay. That's like another little um, yoga community within Arville where the groups that we bring stay. Um, right. Yeah. But the bike, we can ride our cycles to Mohanam from Verite, it's all that close. Awesome. And again, sorry, it's blurry, but I'm assuming, help me if I'm wrong, but this is a, a group of people that you took to India? Is this a, is that, am I right about that? Yeah, yep. So this is one of the groups. Um, this was in, um, so Mohanam originally was a school building in a, a local village where um, I think it was started about 15 or 20 years ago, again, by Rajavani and Balu, because they wanted to help uh, women to be able to work and they wanted to provide a place where children could go to school, like young children under age five. Um, so this is that original school building before they received government funding to build the buildings on the new Mohanam land, which is in Arville now. Right. So yeah, this is one of the groups. Um, yeah. And then it looks like um, here your children are with you with a dear friend and her son, I'm assuming. And this looks like it's in your space or in Massachusetts, but I could be wrong. So I'm, I'm, making a story, but help me know the real story. <laughs> yeah, so the the uh, spiritual sister and brother I mentioned, who um, were very much, it's like our life is here and there, on pause right now because of COVID, but um, yeah, so this is Rajavani and her son, Samaran, and um, we do a lot of collaborating together. And actually she, she helped me with some like recipes in the Birthing Mama book. I think only one of her recipes I think it's Rajavani's Rasam ended up in, in the Birthing Mama book, but I have learned so much. You know, it's like I studied yoga and practiced yoga in the West for 20 years, but in, in being in relationship with Rajavani who, you know, grew up opposite from me, literally in, uh, in these villages that then became part of Araville, um, but she was working starting from the age of 11, you know, in these, in, in Arville. Um, and she, she embodies and lives an aspect of yoga. And so does a lot of people in India that I've been blessed to be in relationship with. It's like, there's an aspect of yoga that you can't learn and embody and practice until you're immersed in the culture, 
immersed in the people and the smells and the sights. So I've learned so much around uh, like the inner workings of yoga from this, this beloved friend of mine and family and like the extended Indian family. Right, and here you are. Yeah. I love that. I have, yeah, so okay, we're getting close to the end here. I want to, um, I, I put this as a transition slide, Corinne, just as the light, you know, the light of your story. And I wanted to have that lead us to reflections on this new book that you're launching into the world. And so I wanna make sure you can speak to that and then invite people to your practice and explain what pay from the heart is and then we're done. So we're very close to the end, but yeah, let me ask you about Birthing Mama and, and then you can tell us about your work. I'm going to stop the share so we can actually see you directly. You're so beautiful here. I don't want to uh, only have pictures, but why don't you take the last few minutes and really share where you are now, what's going on with your work now, and how can people plug in now? Where can we get this book? What is it about? Uh, how can we take classes with you? What does pay from the heart mean? Yeah, great. All right, so yeah, Birthing Mama, this is the new baby that I've birthed. Um, and the book, uh, well, I think it's worth sharing this. So about 10 years ago, I created um, Birthing Mama online program with tons of, you know, over 150 pages of written material and practice videos and audio recordings. Um, and it was all through guidance. You know, I talked about Mahashakti. It was all like I was told I was pregnant. My pregnancies were difficult. Uh, my births were home births, but they were difficult. I saw pregnancy and birth and my personal motherhood journey as a spiritual practice unto itself. So I was called to create this online program to support people going through pregnancy and birth and then the lifelong journey of parenthood as a spiritual practice. Right, because it's not just this thing that we get through because we want to have a child. It in and of itself is a pathway towards awakening. So I put all of these things that I love and that supported me into this online program. I then found out, you know, after it was up and running for eight or so years, that the the hosting company was going to die. It was going to fade away. And, you know, um, death needs to be honored of any kind, whether it's a person, a place, a business, a time, an era. And in the honoring of this, knowing this was going to die, I, I prayed, I meditated, I went to the woods. The woods is really where I receive guidance the most. And I heard, uh, send a proposal to the local story publishing company. They're going to publish this book. They're going to turn your online program into a book. And so that's what happened. And it, it amazed me. I was like, what, really? I'm gonna write a book? So we did story publishing. Um, it was, a, you know, a lot of it was already written but I added a first trimester chapter and a fourth trimester chapter. Um, it's, there is a lot of depth and wisdom packed into the pages of this book. So um, you can get it at your local bookstore. You can get it on Amazon. Um, the, the new website, birthingmama.com, will be up and running this week, hopefully. Um, but if you go to the old website, birthingmama.org, you'll get rerouted to it. Birthingmama.org is currently in a, it's like a construction zone. So you have to kind of ignore what you see on it. But the new one is really going to be a, a beautiful expression of where things are at now. And what I'm really excited about is I've now taught, I think, five years of the prenatal and postnatal yoga teacher training and I've got all these great teachers so um, we're in the beginning right now of um, designing the schedule for the fall so what we will be offering um, well all of my yoga classes are continuing online and they will be in person when and if we find a space so all of that can be found at yogacenteramherst.com and then the vision for Birthing Mama, in addition, I do hope you'll all get the book and, and share it with your birth centers. And that, you know, this book is not just for pregnant people, it's for doulas, it's for yoga teachers, it's for midwives, it's for um, nurses who are working in the labor and delivery in the hospital. Um, so I, I encourage you all to, to get it. And then I'm super excited because we will be offering more and more classes come fall and winter that are taught by not just myself, but 
are the incredible students that I've been blessed to, to not just train, but to learn from. So um, like Kirsty, who's on the call here is going to be teaching a pregnancy wisdom circle and a postpartum wisdom circle. And we'll continue with our prenatal and our postnatal yoga classes. Um, there's going to be a lot coming. So I would say, look out, you know, for what's to come and also share with us what's in your heart. Um, oh, another thing that I'm going to be doing more of is, uh, the grief classes. So six week awakening through grief. Um, and I will be doing some that are specifically for people who have gone through, um, infant or child loss. I trained also with Amy in addition to the, the grief training with Wendy, um, and, and yeah, I, I have to say, you know, birth, breath and death, it's, it's what it's all about, like the beginning, the middle and the end. And I am called to, to honor the full spectrum. And, and that's what we'll be doing a lot of in the coming year. So did that answer everything? Yes. So all of you, please, please, please get to know Corinne um, personally, professionally as a yoga teacher as a person who may train you to be a yoga teacher or deepen your own yoga teaching. And then the book that, I mean, anytime I hear someone's pregnant, that's the book I want to send them. You know, it's beautiful. I love you, dear one. Thank you so much for being with me on the July Institute webinar. And this is sent to all the Institute members, which are about 800 plus now as well. Corinne, send this to your community and share it far and wide. I will. Well, thank you so much, my beloved sister and friend and colleague. I'm, I'm so grateful. And yeah, and thank you to you all who are here live and watching the recording. And feel free to reach out. I, I love um, being in dialogue with all of you about, um, especially about the things that people don't feel like they can talk about, you know, the, the yucky things, the weird things, the painful things. Um, that are related to, to life um, and pregnancy and birth and, and also loss. So yeah, I'd love to hear from you. And I also do private sessions in addition to the classes and the teacher trainings if um, you know, the more intimate and the one-on-one -on -one is speaking to you. So thank you for your time and listening and receiving. Thank you, Corinne Andrews for your light. Mm -hmm. All right, everyone, thank you for being with us for the Institute webinar for July 2021. This will be shared and uh, stay in touch with Corinne. Okay, goodbye. Thank you all. You can shout out a goodbye. We had some folks live with us. Thank you.